Uh, thanks everyone for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. If you don't already do so, please follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome Margaret Renkel and Mary Laurie Philpott. Margaret Renkel is the author of Heartache from the American South and Late Migrations, A Natural History of Love and Loss. She's an opinion writer for the New York Times, where her essays appear weekly. Her work has also appeared in Guernica, Literary Hub, Proximity, and River Teeth, among others. For the past four years, Rankle's columns have offered readers of the New York Times a weekly dose of natural beauty, human decency, and persistent hope from her home in Nashville. Now, more than 60 of those pieces have been brought together in her sparkling new collection, Graceland at Last, Notes on Hope and Heartache from the American South. These essays describe the many Souths, red and blue, rural and urban, mountain and coast, black and white and brown. No one writer could possibly represent all of them. But in Graceland at last, Rankel writes from her own experience about the complexities of her homeland, demonstrating along the way how much more there is to this tangled region than many people understand. In a patchwork quilt of personal and reported essays, Rankel also highlights some other voices of the South, people who are fighting for a better future for the region, a group of teenagers who organized a, a youth march for Black Lives Matter, an urban shepherd whose sheep remove invasive vegetation, church parishioners sheltering the homeless. Throughout, the readers will find the generosity of spirit and deep attention to the world, human and non-human, that keep readers returning to Rankle's columns each Monday morning. Joining Rankle in conversation this evening is Mary Laura Philpott. Mary Laura is the author of the national bestseller, I Miss You When I Blink, and the memoirs in essay, uh, the memoir in essays, Bomb Shelter, which is coming out next April. Keep your eyes out for that. Her writing has been frequently uh, featured in the New York Times and also appears in the Washington Post, the Atlantic, Paris Review, Oprah Magazine, and other publications. This evening's event includes an audience Q&A. So you can use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. And if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, you can upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. And most importantly, please consider supporting Margaret and Powell's by purchasing a copy of her new book from us. A link to buy Graceland at last, along with a link to Mary Laura's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times tonight. Margaret, Mary Laura, we're really thrilled to welcome you both. Thanks for joining us this evening, uh, all the way from Nashville. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for having us, Kevin. Mm -hmm. All right, here we are. I'm going to make sure everyone sees this book, this beautiful, beautiful book that you wrote all about how much you love Elvis. I did. The <laughs> whole thing is like Elvis. Show, show your mug. Like Elvis actually appears in only one essay, but okay. But I brought my Elvis glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I should have to take those off. That hurts my head. Um, welcome, Margaret, back to my house where you often are when I'm not at your house. Do we tell Kevin where I wrote a good bit of this book? We did not tell the people. Why are we at this table? <laughs> We're at this kitchen table because we wrote uh, Late Migrations, my book, mm -hmm. first book, and I Miss You When I Blink, Mary Laura's first book, and Graceland at Last, my second book. And I hid this over here so Mary Laura wouldn't stop me from what showing are you, you doing? Bomb Shelter, Mary Laura's next book, which comes out in April. Put that down. <laughs> we have a writer's group that meets, uh, used to meet once a week. Um, we've, we stopped meeting at all during the pandemic except on Zoom. And then we have tentatively resumed meeting um, on Mary Laura's screen porch. And now that we're all vaccinated, we're kind of meeting again um, to write together. And so we, I actually wrote some of these pieces right here at this kitchen table 
Mary Laura wrote some of her essays um, in both books at my kitchen table. Yeah. So we thought this would be a good place. To Back to the scene of the crime. Um, and I'm gonna hand it to our, our writers group, Maria Browning, Susanna Feltz, Carrington Fox. During the coldest part of the pandemic, when we were like, we have to, we have to get together, even though it, the only safe way to do it is outside. We bundled up, we built a fire out and on the porch. We had blankets, hats. we had hats and gloves. And, yes. we, and we sat like 10 feet from each other outside. We made it happen. That's what you have to do if you want. No, that is not true. Kids. That is not what you have to do. <laughs> but it was really, really helpful. To and us. everyone in Portland would have laughed at these Tennessee women going, oh my God, it's so cold. It's 52. <laughs> it was cold. It's freezing. Okay, let's talk about your beautiful book. Okay. I'm going to show it again. <laughs> We're going to talk about this book from the outside in because first of all, I just want to acknowledge what a gorgeous object this is. It is, Milkweed makes these books that are like collector's items. It's not just like, oh, in order to get to the stuff within, we have to put it on some paper here. We printed it. First of all, it's heavy. It's on really nice paper. <laughs> I, you were making fun of me because when I got- she looked like Vanna. When I got, Vanna my, White when I got my copies, I was like, this font is amazing. And you said, who notices the font? People notice. They may not know that's what they're noticing, right? but they do. And Milkweed just does a gorgeous, gorgeous job. What is it like to work with them? They are not like every other publisher. Well, they're my only publisher, so I have no real point of reference, but um, I do know genius when I see it. And I know that my editor, Joey McGarvey, is truly a genius. Um, and I know that Mary Austin Speaker, the creative director at Milkweed, is also a genius. I mean, this um, this cover is it, the the artist the, who did the artwork behind the lettering is my brother Billy Wrinkle. You can see his work at BillyWrinkle.com. But he he's a collage artist and he does um, analog like real collages where you have to have tiny little scissors and exacto knives and 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 if you look at it up close, you can see the difference between a digital collage, you can't see it on the screen, Mary Laura, but you can see it, the, um, Mary Austin Speaker, when she, when she put this whole arrangement together, she did it in a way that you, it almost looks three-dimensional, mm -hmm. and then when you touch it, it is three-dimensional. Three I was so surprised when my author copies came, because I didn't know it was going to be embossed. I love it. I, I mean, it just, it feels good. It looks good. And it's, and when Billy, your brother works with Milkweed, he doesn't go through you. He works directly. No, with he them, won't. Right? He won't tell me anything. It makes me really mad. He won't give me any hints at what they're think, working on, but these are just antique vintage postcards from various places in the South that he's cut into tiny little strips. And it represents um, two things, I think. Um, one, just the, the way the the collection spans different parts of the South, not just Nashville and not just Alabama where I grew up, but, um, but it also kind of mimics the patchwork nature of an essay collection. Yeah. Anyway. It really does, it's gorgeous. Um, okay, now we're gonna get into the inside, the inside part. So the essays in this collection, all of which were published by the New York Times, Except for the introduction and the conclusion. Right. So you kind of get two bonus essays. You get the, the first and the, and the last. They span from 2017 to 2020. Is that right? Sounds right. Roughly. Mm -hmm. you, you wrote them. Um, it moved around a little bit. It was a little bit of a move. I had a version and then working with Joey, we came up with a different version for the, for the galleys that went out back in the winter. And then we wanted to update the the collection with some newer pieces so that it was as timely as possible. Um, so some of the ones, so it's, I don't actually know exactly which ones are in there. I have to look at the table of contents <laughs> because it changed a few times, but yeah, it's good. I started writing for the, my first piece in the Times ran in 2015. Mm -hmm. And I started writing regularly um, in 2017. Yeah. Yeah. But what I like, about this collection and the way it's put together. And I remember when you were working on this is that it's not chronological. It's not like you start with essay number one and that's the beginning of 2017. And then it goes, you know, essay by essay all the way through these, these three years, you grouped them into 
subject matter groupings. Right. And one of my favorite subject matter groupings that you made is politics and religion, which I think is a smashing combination. <laughs> and I mean smashing in all possible. Well, all properly brought up. That. Southern ladies are taught never to discuss either of those right. subjects. And you put them together. I did. Yes. What was what was the hardest part of, of choosing kind of what you would put together and then also what you would leave out? Because not everything you wrote. No, it's, it's maybe 20 or 25 percent of the ones that I wrote during that time. How did you choose? Well, I was trying to make is I was trying to make a book. I was not trying to do a greatest hits or the ones that had the most traffic or the ones I like personally, I was trying to do a, make a collection that presented a coherent whole out of disparate parts. And I thought just as many different aspects of what it means to be Southern, what it's like to live here. Um, my column, the tagline on my column says that I covered the flora, fauna, politics, and culture of the American South. But you can't write about the American South without addressing religion. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Bible Belt, and Nashville's the buckle of the Bible Belt, I heard when we moved to Nashville 34 years ago. Um, 35 for anyway, a long, long time ago. And, um, and, and also, I didn't want to leave out the family, some of the family essays I've written, because I wanted people to know the, the world I came from, so they would know why I've taken the political positions I've taken or not taken as as the case may be. So a lot of it was just trying to pick things that I thought would um, make a, 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 a book and not just a jumble of things. I'm glad you kept some of the family ones in there. The one about your son's wedding. I was really glad that made it in there. I mean, it's, it, the, the personal stuff is what makes everything else matter. You know, that's why you care whether we have an earth and whether, you, you know, Right. Well, and it's also true. I mean, I think that's one of the things I don't want to imply that I think that Southerners have some kind of corner on the family market. But I do think that um, uh, rural people in general, more, maybe more so than people who arrive in cities from all different places, have a connection to the past. Their ancestors are buried in the same graveyard. Um, you know, they there's a there's a sense of family that um, that isn't unique to the South or even unique to rural people, but it's certainly very prominent in the South and very prominent in the rural South, especially, or at least the rural South that I came from and that my husband came from. And for you, that was Alabama. For me, that was Alabama. I've kind of been around. I went to, um, I, I grew up in Alabama. I went to graduate school in South Carolina. Um, I married a Georgia boy. Mm -hmm. I moved to Tennessee. You've got a lot of it covered. Some of it. <laughs> was it difficult as you were as you were piecing together this manuscript and working with essays that you had written months or years prior to putting this together? You couldn't you couldn't edit them, could mm -hmm. you? Because there are the temptation the was just intense. I had yeah. practically had to tie my hands behind my back because um, I was wrong about some stuff, and I just wanted to not be wrong. In retrospect, I wanted to. So, uh, for example, I thought that um, all the Trump voters were going to turn, were going to feel betrayed when they realized what, you know, mm -hmm. buyer's remorse was going to be huge, and that didn't happen. Um, yeah. But I wanted to be in putting the book together. I wanted it to be faithful to the experience of um, going through that. It's not the essays are. There's a date on each essay, and that's to just provide some orientation. But I didn't update or um or correct any yeah any things um i did because because i it turns out you i have ticks as a writer and <laughs> certain words i really like and Little phrases like what yeah i like the word small joey joey said did you realize that you have the word small in this manuscript 57 times and it's like well no but now that you pointed it out i'm gonna be really careful about you, you. do pay a lot of attention to things that are small tiny little Which things is, tiny i have almost as many as small of. right yes that's part of why we love you is you give attention to the things that are small that other people don't pay attention to that's a nice way to put it uh, <laughs> 
but some of them are just you know as writer a writer yeah. you just um mm -hmm. you, there are certain turns of phrase that you just latch on to and you don't mean to repeat them so we yeah. did take out some of that stuff okay but otherwise they are as they ran there's no you know in retrospect no there was a little bit in a couple of places where the time stamp was for an event that sort of was a shooting star it was like everybody okay. knew what we were talking about that week mm -hmm. but two years later there might need to be a phrase a little clarifying mm -hmm. just a little phrase to sort of orient our readers you and i have talked before about nuance in conversation and in writing and i always say this is what i love about your writing is that you lean toward nuance and away from stereotypes and you know good bad black white this is why i love your writing but you you have said people don't want nuance why do you say that because i keep getting attacked um on twitter for um i would say willful misreading perhaps mm -hmm. i think one of the things that happens in our era and it's an unfortunate thing is that we're just responding like this we respond to people respond to headlines and they are and they are responding to the headlines and the publications have developed um, a headline writing style that encourages yep. that yeah. response. Um, and so it, it, it's, it can be incredibly discouraging. But I do think there's maybe a difference between nuance and complexity. And I like both of them. Yes. But I, I think that nuance is a little harder to transmit in a weekly newspaper essay, just because people are reading so quickly. It's they're in a hurry, they're checking their phone, they're checking their their um, their home screen might be set to the New York Times. And they're and they're just going to pick one or two things to read that morning. And they're going to be things are going to be swirling around. It's hard to convey nuance in a setting like that when people are reading that way. It's not hard to it's not nearly as hard to land on the fact that things are always more complicated yes. than a headline is going to be able to convey. Yes. I would argue it is difficult to get people to slow down enough to read and absorb the nuance, but it is there in, in what you write. And that's what I... Um, Look at you dog ear in this I, book. I know. <laughs> it's, I have two copies, one that I have just mangled all up and one that I keep pristine. <laughs> one, one that I got sent for free and one that I paid for because friends pay retail. Um, Gosh, you have a, a sentence in here and I wrote it down and now I don't remember which one it was in, but you said, none of us is innocent. And it, it almost doesn't matter which essay it's in because I feel like you make that point frequently. There is no, there's no perspective from which anybody can sit back and go, well, I'm the good guy who does things right. And all y'all are the wrong, are wrong. And I think, even for people who are trying their best to, on any of these subjects, not use Roundup in their yard, research before they vote, you know, any of these things, it's not safe to sit back and go, well, I'm innocent and I'm making the right choices because then you get complacent and that's how we end up kind of sliding down some of the hills that we've slid down. Talk about this none of us is innocent idea. Well, I do, I have to say, yeah. because of the whole complexity nuance mm -hmm. question, I do think some people are more innocent than others. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely do. Some are think certainly more guilty. Than there others. are more, there's, <laughs> there's plenty of guilt to be had, and we will save extra helpings for certain people. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I guess one of the things that I, is most discouraging about the tenor of public discourse right now to me is how everybody wants to make it black or white. And it's not just, I'm innocent, you're bad. Um, it's, it's all of it. There's no room for anybody to be more than this one thing. And often that one thing is the way they vote mm -hmm. um, or even don't necessarily vote because a lot of people don't vote. They, this, the, the framework, the political framework through which they view current events. And um, I just think the only way you can actually see, see the world in those terms is to be in such a bubble 
that you don't know anybody who disagrees with you. Right. And, and, and there clearly must be people like that, but I am definitely not like that. I am in a family where people disagree with each other. I am in a neighborhood where people disagree sure. with each other, a church where people disagree with each other. This ability to say, okay, well, I don't agree with what you say on this subject. And in fact, I think that the way you think on that subject is going to let in, end up in the destruction of the entire planet. But I don't think you're a terrible person. And I think that, I hope that that's the beginning of an ability to make a connection. I don't know if it is anymore, honestly, but that's what I hope. Yeah. You're, I'm going to remind everybody as we just keep chit-chatting, you are welcome to put your questions in the Q&A function and we are going to get to those at some point. Um, tell me about, tell these nice people about the difficulties of writing about Christianity and now, why did you go whole. straight to religion and politics? Because, because here's why. Okay. I can't stand to read anyone writing about religion. I really can't because I feel like most of the time what I read is very, it comes from that place of I am innocent and all of you are not. Right. And it's hard to look at any religion, but Christianity, particularly contemporary Christianity, which includes... Yeah, it's not getting very good press right now. Right, evangelicals, it includes all sorts of things, but you approach it with this very clear-eyed openness about what's wrong, but also you, you have empathy for the human beings who follow some of this stuff, and that's rare, I think. What, what, why do you keep going back to it? Because I know you get beaten up for it. I do. Especially on our good friend Twitter. I get beaten up for it. Well, because I think um, there's a reason that there are so many religions. There, what people need from the world is not um, available from any one cultural artifact um, or any religion, much less any particular denomination, but that need to connect with something larger yeah. to believe that that something larger is benevolent and, and has um, compassion for this incredibly messed up species that we are, I think that's fairly close to universal. And I, I'm going to have to be really careful because I don't think when I mean by universal, I don't mean every individual. Yeah. I mean, cultures have it it's because it, it gives us something. Mm -hmm. And for me, it is a great source of solace. I don't like feeling that I'm alone in the responsibilities of being a citizen or a wife or a mother or even a writer for the New York Times. I like feeling a part of something um, that transcends the temporal. And so that for all its imperfections, that's Religion is the box we put those feelings in. Gosh, I love how you say things. Um, I want to talk about other things that give you solace, such as your yard. My teeny little scruffy half acre yard. Beautiful, amazing yard. Mm -hmm. What's going on in your yard these days? Today, I was in so, I was. We, I have a butterfly garden. I actually have two now and I have not seen butterflies this year. It's been a terrible, terrible year for butterflies. And I thought at first it was something was going on in just my yard or just my neighborhood. But our friend Maria, who's Marie Browning, another writer who's in our group, and she lives way out in the country and she has not seen butterflies either. And um, I, several of the um, uh, naturalists here in town that I follow on Instagram, they're reporting fewer than, way fewer than usual butterflies. And it could have been that terrible five days of rain, two times in a row that we had, or yeah. it could have been um, the really late spring freeze. It could be um, pesticides. It could be climate change. There's a lot of things that could explain it. But today in my yard, there was a monarch on one of my zinnias. And I took a picture of it and put it on Instagram because that's what you do. Okay, of course. Yes. To, I'll, I'll go like So it. if I'm going to have a source of hope, I'm going to share it because I had no butterflies this year. I had one little cabbage white and 
one little clouded self or a little pretty yellow butterfly and one swallowtail, it was going too fast for me to tell whether it was a dark morph tiger swallowtail or an actual black swallowtail and, and then nothing. This one shabby beat up um, monarch was there earlier, but she wasn't laying eggs. Oh. But then this, this was a really handsome, beautiful Healthy. nude. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, I'm glad you shared it on Instagram. You're very sharing. It, she has given me many seedlings. <laughs> Which how many Most of, you of which I've killed. <laughs> Some of which my yard animals have eaten. But guess what? Guess what is in my fridge right now? An envelope full of milkweed seeds from? that I harvested from the milkweed that you gave me that grew up into big milkweed and made pods. Awesome. I'm so excited. Um, what else do I want to talk about? I, we're getting some, a lot of questions about your work with the New York Times. People okay. are very curious about this. Sure. So we will get into the specifics of these questions. But first, why don't you tell us what your, your weekly process looks like? Because I know you've gotten into kind of a rhythm now as to what you do on which days of the week. How does that go? Well, I would like there to be a rhythm. <laughs> you try there to is a, a plan to the rhythm, but no actual rhythm. No, I, I'm always reading and saving links. So I have a, a document um, that lists a bunch of stuff I might want to write about. And, and anytime I come across a story in another publication, I save the link. So the next time I write about what trees do for um, urban communities, or the next time I write about, um, you know, country music's racism problem or something like that, I have the links saved and then I can come back to them. And that that's about half the amount of research that I would need for a, a, a typical piece. And then once I decide what I'm going to write about and I, my editor approves it, then I can start doing more intensive research. And I start, try to start reading on Tuesday and I try to start drafting on Wednesday and I try to wake up Thursday morning and go through it one or two or three more times and then send it in Thursday okay. afternoon. And then there's a whole bunch of back and forth with various editors, my right. editor first and then his editor and then the cubby editor. And then it's, it's a big community effort. What happens if you get to Thursday morning and the thing you have written about there's some major news. It happens change, all the time. Then what? You just go back to it and I update catch it. Up. Yeah. In fact, I have, you know, God bless him, Peter Catapano, my, I'm really blessed with editors. I know there are writers who don't especially like editors. Um, oh, seems, I know this as good. somebody who editor. was once an editor for 10 years, I was an editor and there were plenty of people who didn't like being edited, <laughs> but I love being edited. I love having another pair of eyes, somebody who knows more than I know, who is not been sitting with these words in this order through three or four or five drafts and who can see where the holes are and make it better yeah or just like I don't I'm not really following you here or um this seems a little harsh are you sure you want to be this harsh or anything I mean Peter is always um it, it being my sort of moral compass in that way but but then there are times when you know I'm I'm like emailing him at six o'clock on Sunday night, you, you know, the story set to run at five o'clock Monday morning, and we have to completely rewrite Ooh. one of the paragraphs or update some links or some numbers. Yeah, that happens all the time. That's what happens when you have a Monday column, though. So Gosh. what would happen if you had Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all those call people who write for those days, as soon as theirs is finished, it can just go up, but mine's going to be sitting around all weekend. Can you think of one where that happened, where it kind of blew up and you had to you know. Well, the whole pandemic, all those numbers change. Every any time I write about the pandemic, there's going to be something that needs updating by the time before, right before the piece runs. Then there's like whenever there's a big cultural phenomenon, like the murder of George Floyd, mm -hmm. what initially starts out looking like one thing can snowball, and within you know, three days, four days, five days. Um, it's a story so huge that the approach I was planning yeah. was 
had already been done 20 times. So now I need to find a new way into that subject. Whew. Do you ever feel like you've done enough research or do you always feel a little nervous that there, there's something you may not have found? Oh gosh, it's not a matter of being nervous. It's a matter of being certain about that. <laughs> I'm a generalist. I'm never going to know and I hear from the experts all the time, whatever subject I write about, I'm the generalist. There's nothing about which I am an expert. So <laughs> those butterfly experts have found you. <laughs> everybody, birds, the bird experts, the caterpillar experts, the, you know, racism <laughs> experts, the epidemiologists, they all find me because they know this is their subject. They know it, it inside and out. And I know just enough to write 1200 words about it. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing I tell myself, maybe I couldn't have done this when I was your age, when I was younger and more. Um, 25. Yeah. When I was younger and feeling um, terrible when I messed up. Now I think about my, my old friend, Jonathan Marks, when we worked together, he was my editor at the National Scene years and years ago. And, and I, I made some, when I was the book editor, I. I let some really horrible, egregious error get into mm -hmm. print and, and I was apologizing and stumbling all over myself. And he said, you'll do better next week. So I tell myself, well, I'll That's do better. Attitude. If I mess up, I, it's not because I didn't try. I don't ever phone it in. I'm trying right. as hard as I can, but I can't become an expert on every subject that I need to write about in one week's time. No, no matter how much I read. Your expertise is, is in helping us all to see these things from multiple angles and, and slow down and breathe. And well, that's a nice way to put it. What I think it, my expertise is, is bearing a lot of links in my articles. <laughs> so if you want to know more, all you have to do is click something I put in there. I'm very good at that. I deliberately, when I first started writing for the times, there was, a, I guess, an unspoken kind of recommendation that you didn't really put in more than maybe three links. And I like to put in 30 links if I can. I want to put in, I want for I one like thing. That. I like the interactive reading experience. Well, it can be annoying and it's, and, it, and I can understand from a publication standpoint why you wouldn't want to leave people Drive over people away. to, you know, oh, here's this piece in the Washington Post. Oops. But that's the way um, the interconnected world works. Read. Yeah. And I, and I just really feel like an opinion writer's entire work is comes on the backs of the true reporters, the true journalists, the people who are out there chasing a story um, and following people who do not want to be followed. I mean, who, who don't want this information to come out, who are putting in the request for public records and who are staying with it and they need credit, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, and every single time I have, I have formed a, an opinion on the basis of somebody else's hard work. I want that work to be acknowledged. Uh, some of the questions people have about your New York Times work, they want to know about the word limit. Why are they the length that they are? You didn't come up with that word limit. I did not. No. I'm chafing against it every single week. Yeah. I, I, the, the word limit is a little bit fluid because there's not a limit on the internet to space, mm -hmm. but there is a very definite limit to attention spans within this context. Well, that's one of the nice things about putting together a book is that you know that the people who are reading the book are reading it in a really different yes. way yes. from the way, even I, in proofreading the book, although I have already found one error, but in proofreading it, all those times I went through it, I was reading my own work differently yeah. from the way I read when I'm reading it on online or in the newspaper. So it's a it's it's partly about just um, I don't know, just how long will people hang in there? And yeah. I have written pieces. There are pieces in this book that are around 1800, maybe even a couple that are 2000 words. But my natural length is about 1200 words. And that's where I tend to land. I'll, I'll write 1500 words, I'll carve it down to 1200 words, and then I'll, that's when I let it sit. And then I, then I go back and I try to car carve out another 100 or 150 words because that's about as long as I can get away with. It's around 1050 or 1100 words. Isn't that neat though, that you know your natural... That's like, from writing with the, for the scene for so long. I had a weekly column from the Nashville scene 20, shoot. 25 years ago I started that column and I did it for I don't know five or six or seven years and 
that the, a full page in the scene in those days was 1200 words and that's what I wrote so that's what you and so I just right. kind of a groove got carved in my brain I think mm -hmm. um some folks are wondering how who decides whether comments are turned on that is a really good question and I do not know the answer to that question I don't either and I have mixed feelings about the comments too well somebody pointed out that a lot of times the comments on your pieces are very kind um, kind they're hopeful and caring and thoughtful which is not always the case in comments and they aren't always the case with my comments either yeah but um you know what 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 usually happens is that uh, my brother or my husband will read the comments and tell <laughs> <laughs> and read the nice ones to me so i don't have to see the mean ones um it's good to have somebody who could do but that. but you know if the comments are turned on that's that benefits me if, if I've written something that makes people mad, because it means they are less apt to come after me on social media because oh, they have a place to put their fury. It's a good outlet. But but if the comments are turned on, I mean, I'm going to look at them. Some of them. It's I'm, hard not to. It's, I always say I'm not going to look at the comments and then I'll <laughs> think a piece is doing really well and I go, I'm just going to go I'm just gonna look see at the one. nice things they say and then I see the horror and I'm like, I'm never going to look at comments. Yeah, and that, that's just the way the human mind works. There can be 99 sweet things and one really mean one and, and that's, that's the sticks. one. And you're and it's at three o'clock in the morning, you're going, gosh, he was right. I really am just full of it. Yeah. Um, it's always a he. <laughs> It's always a he. That's the title of our next book that we write together. <laughs> um, someone is asking about, and I'm curious about this too, how do you protect your, your mental health, your thought space in your head from all those voices that are coming at you in the comment section, on Twitter, everywhere else, all those opinions coming at you. How do they, how do you keep from letting that paralyze you? I'm old. <laughs> I'm postmenopausal. The answer is be old. <laughs> no, just go through menopause and then you won't care. The truth <laughs> is, I don't think I could have done this when I was younger. I yeah. think I would have felt more acutely. I would have felt pained by how many people I was making angry. Um, but I'm old enough now where I just, I kind of just go, well, either you're stupid or you're mean or you haven't read very carefully or we just agree to disagree but in none of those scenarios am i required to respond to you that makes a huge difference mm -hmm. not engaging we've all learned that lesson mm -hmm. um okay we've got another great audience question do you find that it is easier to write with your group or alone it is definitely easier to write with the group and here's why <laughs> it's kind of like study hall you are you, you you whereas i might in my normal writing space go oh i'm just going to check email for a second oh i'm just going to get up and see whether there's a <laughs> butterfly in my garden yet oh i'm just going to you know there's there's like a 9 million um officially sanctioned ways to procrastinate yeah. but when you're in the room with other people whose work is inspiring to you mm -hmm. and whose work is um, getting done right before your eyes, then you are more apt to just kind of, I am anyway, stay focused and keep going. Yeah, I, I, I feel like it could be useful to share. We've just sort of restructured our writing group a little bit in terms of how we spend our time. And we now divide our meetings into two kinds. We have study hall. We have study hall. Where we sit and, and write. And you know, if you're tempted to get up and do things, you have to look over and see that your friend is not getting up. You have to things. actually get in your car and drive away. Right. Because all that stuff is at your house. Right, right. It's so not we, at Mary Laura's house. <laughs> we have study hall. And then we have the, the other kind, which we used to do all the time, but now we're kind of spacing it out where we everyone brings something to read and we talk it, talk it out. Talk it's kind of like having a deadline. Yeah. So so that's this other good thing about a group is that if you don't have an artificially imposed deadline in the form of an editor telling you, you I can't do my job until you do your job, then knowing that there are people who, who, whom you love and respect waiting for you and expecting this of you, then you're going to do it. So I think the deadline and the and the shared focus, the peer pressure, if you, if you yeah. want to call it that, is very helpful. I just think that, you know, it was my writer's group. It was Mary Laura and Susanna and Carrington and Maria who said to me, 
it may be maybe a year after I started writing the essays that became late migrations, I thought I was just writing those essays for myself as a kind of um, way of working through grief after my mother died. And, and I don't remember which one of y'all, it was probably, probably you, all of us said, you know, you're writing a book. And I didn't know I was writing a book, but after y'all said it a few times, then I thought, huh, maybe I'm writing, maybe a, I'm book. writing a book. And then we said the same thing to you. Yeah. We've said the same thing to Maria. We're all writing books. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's a question. So that with late migrations, you had written a lot of it before you, before you verbalized and kind of faced, oh, I am writing a book with, with Graceland at last, you were writing these, col these pieces for this column every week for quite some time before someone said, hey, we're going to put these together in a book. How are you going to trick yourself into writing your next book? So that you don't know you're writing a book, but you're writing it. I I, I have a contract for my next book, <laughs> so I can't trick myself. So I have to just write it. Is that going to mess with you a little bit? Like it's going already into messed with me a little bit. Yeah. yeah, because there's so much more weight on it. Yeah, you know, from the start. Yeah, because you know it's going to be a book, and somebody thinks it's going to be a book, and they paid you some money for it. And um, yeah, the great thing about, I mean. Late Migrations is a really short book. It's only about 50,000 words and that includes the acknowledgements. <laughs> but so, if, so, you know, really I write way more than one Late Migrations every year, just writing for the times, yeah. but it doesn't have that weight. It doesn't feel heavy in that sense of you have this responsibility to do it. But I'm excited about the project and it's fun. And nobody is tweeting at me about it. And yes, nobody is yours. commenting. It just belongs to me. And y'all are sweet. Y'all say nice things about it. So <laughs> I think it's going to be okay. Because it's good. Okay. More audience questions. Who are some of your favorite Southern writers or those who inspire you that capture the nuance of the area and the culture well? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because there's this Stop. writer <laughs> whose work does that very thing. Yes. And I missed you when I'm Blink and in Bomb Shelter, which is available for pre-order now. But, but I'm also, and in addition to Mary Laura Philpott, yes. You know, the the there's a lot of I love, there's so many. This is a golden age for nonfiction, I think. Yeah. And there's even the people who I think of as being primarily novelists or primarily poets will write a, an unbelievably beautiful essay in a Ryan magazine mm -hmm. or an unbelievably challenging and, um, and thought provoking essay in Harper's or in the Atlantic. So there's almost no writer whose work I admire right now who doesn't do that to some degree. Um, Ann Patchett has a new book of essays coming out in November and, and it is a work of brilliance. I've, I've read it and I read every one of those pieces when they were coming out in various mm -hmm. places and now I've read the book. Um, the, it's called um, These Precious Days. These Precious Days. Um, the novelist Silas House, he has really, um, it, he's a Kentucky, poet and novelist, but he writes these really beautiful nonfiction pieces mm -hmm. for the Atlantic. Um, I think of, I'm, I'm just, I hate naming names because I, I it's going to, I'm going to leave out somebody really fantastic. What people should do if they want the answer to this question is follow you on various social media, particularly Twitter, because you do share every time you read an article you love, you tweet it out. And I've discovered things through you. So do that. Well, I, 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 I mean, that's one of the great, uh, one of the few, one of the very vanishingly few great things about Twitter is that if you are following writers you love, you find some stuff that you wouldn't necessarily um, find right off. I know that um, the songwriter, Mary Gaucher, who is from Louisiana and who um, lives in Nashville, she has a new memoir out, um, just came out in July. Um, it's called uh, Saved by a Song. Another songwriter here in Nashville, Allison Moore, she has a new memoir. Come, she's had one memoir called Blood, mm -hmm. came out a couple of years ago. She's got another memoir coming out 
soon. Maybe next week or yeah. maybe Perfect. tomorrow. Soon. Um, called I Dream He Talks to Me mm -hmm. um, about her son's autism diagnosis and how they navigated that. Um, it's a, it, yeah, they're just, Beth Ann Fanley, um, she has this wonderful collection of, micro, she's, a, she's a poet. She's, uh, until very recently, was the poet laureate in Mississippi. She has a collection of micro essays that is just delightful heating and, heating and cooling and it's got a picture of I have mostly melted popsicle on the that's one of my favorite book covers yeah of all time yeah it's I could just go on and on so follow her on Twitter and you will see what she's reading because she always shares it we've got several questions and just comments about being a southerner someone says she lives in the Pacific Northwest now but she was a southerner for her first 48 years and sometimes she felt shameful about that but you make her proud to be a southerner oh that's I'm nice. glad that's it is true that people hear our accent and they think we must be. If you say y'all in an airport, people go. Not anymore, though, less so. Now everybody says y'all, but um, they say y'all at my Minnesota publisher. Maybe really? they just do that to me. You taught them. They're I like, think okay, I we're going to start the call. Everyone say y'all. <laughs> no, but I think, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that people think hear, hear a Southern accent and they automatically assume a bunch of things. They assume you're uneducated. They assume you're a racist. They assume that you're, um, you know, an evangelical Christian. There's a bunch of assumptions that come yeah. along. And, and in general, when people are making those assumptions, none of those things are qualities that are good qualities in their view. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. Somebody asks, do you think Southern culture will continue to be different from other parts of the country in the future now that everyone has such universal access to others? Do people, you? Well, people I, have been worrying about this for a good long while. Yeah, they started worrying about it. I, I know for sure they started worrying about it. They were worrying about it when radio came. Mm -hmm. Then they were worried about television. They were really worried about McDonald's. And they and, you know, the just the um, the interstate off rampization of America. Yeah. Whether that's Walmart or or nowadays Amazon, whatever it is, it there is a kind of universal culture that is hard to escape no matter where you live. But I think a lot of what we think of as, used to think of as North, the North-South divide is mm -hmm. now really much more of an urban rural divide. Mm -hmm. I think you could, in my neighborhood alone, we have, you know, the neighbor just behind us, our back door neighbors are from Boston, our cross the street neighbors are from New York, two doors mm -hmm. down, three doors down, they're, that one direction, their new neighbors from Wisconsin, next door to them, Texas, up on the court, California, down at the dead end, Chicago. They're just people coming from everywhere can come to Nashville and they don't, I think, feel that they're in a massively different place. Yeah. But if you were to take those same people and plop them down in Hohenwald, Tennessee, they would really know <laughs> that they were no longer living in Chicago. So I think that we're in a, we really see a lot more these days, um, cultural divides between the cities and the surrounding countryside, much more so than between the North and the South. Yeah. Atlanta, my goodness. I agree. Atlanta is not, is, is it, it might as well be Brooklyn, practically. Right, right. We've got some pop culture questions. Somebody wants to know, was it fun to do the Today Show? <laughs> it was fun, but also scary. I, I was so nervous. And I, um, and this was, this was pre-pandemic, so you actually went there. You were yeah, I was on watching the, it. You were on, on the, the set. set. Yes, on the set, looking right at Jenna Bush and Hoda. And, and did you have this cute shirt? I had on? this I very same you shirt. You I picked it out shirt. for me. Yes, that mm -hmm. that was wild. That was so fun. And when it but but it was it wasn't a pandemic, but it was the holidays. Oh. So they and whereas most of the time the Today Show is yes. um, live, our sec my segment was. Um, was filmed so that the crew and the could go home for the holidays oh. and so I watched on the back you know in the little embedded tv in a taxi on the way to LaGuardia going home when it finally that's aired. how you saw it that's how I saw it yeah but you mm -hmm. know the thing about the thing that I loved about that experience was was really Jenna um, because yeah. she reads every book that she knows. She's a good reader. Too. Nobody is out there going here, Jenna, 
here are three questions to ask about this book. She's read it and she's read it closely. She's an attentive reader. She is. And she reads probably, I don't know what she said, 10 or 20 times more books than she chooses because she has to see whether she thinks it works with the other books they've recently mm -hmm. chosen and whether um, she knows her audience really well too. And so it's just wonderful to be around somebody with that kind of a platform who wants to use that platform to celebrate to get books. people to read i know it's wonderful it's wonderful uh let's see you've already talked about you you don't go back and revise these essays before they go in the book because they're already on the record um have you ever thought about doing a newsletter i feel like your column is your newsletter you're writing it every week. i just don't see how people do it all i know they do i remember you know i mean if i were working for the tennessean i'd have two or three deadlines a day and I have this piddly little one deadline a week that just it's sucks not piddly my, or little, but it's one. It's one, but it's, you're always assimilating all these facts and thoughts and opinions. Yeah, and but there are plenty of people at the times who are doing that and they're doing it plus writing a newsletter or they're doing it twice a week or they're doing it and a podcast or they're doing it and a, a back and forth with somebody from a different political orientation. It's mind boggling what those people can do. I'm, uh, there's a reason I'm not on the staff of the New York Times. I, it, I'm slow. I'm a slow reader. I'm a slow writer. I need time to think. I need time to sleep on it. So I'm, I'm probably not going to do a newsletter. No. Um, do you, have, oh, this is an interesting question. People may not know this. So when you have a contract for a book, like you're under contract for your next book now, that was not just Milkweed going, would you agree to write another book? Great. You, you actually had an idea for that, right? So there's, mm -hmm. there's a specific book there waiting for you to write yeah they've seen a chunk of it okay they, they no the way it, that typically works it's not how it worked with late migrations my first book but it is how these two worked is that um my agent taught me how to write a, my agent kristen keen bitten who is i keep calling people geniuses but i'm surrounded by geniuses she's also my agent <laughs> we love her she's fantastic but she just she just showed told me what i needed to do to write a book proposal and and so then i wrote this wasn't my idea. This was the Times's idea. Carolyn Quay and the um, book development office at the New York Times came up with the idea for this book. But I still had to figure out the shape it was going to take. All she wanted was a book of columns. And then I had to figure out what was going to be the cohering, you know, idea behind it and the order and which columns and which not. And, um, and then once there was a proposal, then your agent takes it to the publisher and the publisher says yes or no, basically. I think it's about time for Kevin to rejoin us, but while he does that, I just want to urge everyone to go online, order this for all your friends and family as a gift. <laughs> it's, it's just lovely. You will be happy to have a, a hard copy in your hands. They probably will have it in the store by tomorrow. You can go visit Powell's and get your coffee and browse. But if you live far away, order it from Powell's and they will send it to you. This was so fun. It was fun. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Mary Laura, for uh, helping us out tonight with this. And we're excited to see your book next year as well. Um, in the chat, I am putting the link to our YouTube channel. And this event will be going up on our YouTube page uh, probably tomorrow sometime. And if you uh, know some people who missed it, you can direct them to that uh, tomorrow. And once again, there's also a link to Graceland at last in the chat. So click on that and get ready to order that tonight. Um, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Mary Laurie, can you uh, hold up that book again? Can you put it really close to the camera? I wanna see the, the details of that collage. Stop it. <laughs> and there's Bomb Shelter. Yeah, that's like an exclusive sneak peek of bomb shelter. It's so exciting. Everyone that viewed this tonight. It's not quite finished yet. Yeah, it's a this special a beautiful, added beautiful bonus. Thing. Everybody needs one or two or five. Ta -da. Right. Well, thank you both again. And thanks everyone for tuning in. And um, that's it. Have a good night and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Good night.